Now, I think young people coming into organizations today are much more concerned and interested in the purpose of the organization. I think that uh, for for leaders who haven't been internationally socialized, they do have this challenge quite often of judging everybody mm. by the limited experience they've got of of human beings. Because what we tend to do when we're angry and defensive is we close down the 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 um the ability to be empathetic to the other side well i <clears throat> i think that the greatest gift that one human being can give to another is their full presence mm. so if you're a young leader and you're responsible for some people just practice that one Hello, Team ET. Welcome to today's podcast. We're about to explore the world of conscious leadership and organizational change. And as you know, everything in life, in leadership particularly, seems to be accelerating out of control. Globalization, uh, technological advancements, and unprecedented global challenges, all of which, of course, means effective leadership has never been more critical. And I'm happy to say that in our conversation today, we're likely to delve into a whole raft of different topics, but we're going to look at things such as cross-cultural complexities. We're going to talk about psychological safe workplaces. We will talk about inclusion to some extent, I guess, as well as some nuances, some things that I had never heard of until I started doing a little bit of research, ready to speak today with, with our guest. And, and I'm going to try to pronounce one of these nuances now. I'm going to get it wrong, I know, so we'll come back and get clarification. But equine-guided exponential learning? <laughs> equine. Equine, <laughs> equine. Equine-guided. Equine. Okay. All right. We'll come back to that. But thanks, Tom. Look, I'm excited by this conversation. It's a whole minefield of topics. Um, I'm happy to have our guest, Mr. Tom Dennis, here with me. So please um, help me welcome Tom to get into this discussion as we start to really uncover some of the strategies that probably not only overcome conflicts, but also help us build a level of resilience and cohesiveness within our teams. So, Tom, welcome to the ET Project. As you can hear, we've got a broad scope to cover. Hope we're up to it. Wayne, thank you very much indeed. It's uh, it's a delight to be with you. And, and thank you for speaking to me. I think probably a, um, a less civilized hour for you <laughs> than it is for me. <laughs> uh, I, I, this, is, this is my time. So <laughs> thank you for that. Before we get too deep into the conversation, Tom, uh, I guess our listeners would love to know a little bit more about the journey that you've been on. You know, you, you've had a really interesting career. We're going to dive into that. But what what's brought you in particular to where you are at this point in your career? Mm. <clears throat> yes, it does depend a little bit on where one starts. But <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I... I uh, I tried a number of things that didn't quite work for me. I tried to be an airline pilot, um, <laughs> and they, they threw me out when I, I scared the instructors too much. Um, and uh, then I was uh, in engineering. Well, I'd, I'd been brought up as an engineer, really. My father was an engineer, <clears throat> and I worked in his factory on the shop floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, yeah, uh, uh, after a number of years of, of working and working in different factories and stuff. Uh, I, uh, I joined the Royal Marines <clears throat> and that took me uh, 17 years in, uh, um, on a journey of, of adventure and, and experiences. But it also um, put me in the front of a classroom quite a lot. And I mm. hadn't really expected that, but I ended up talking about uh, leadership in all different guises uh, and and so that's that uh that sort of really informed me when i came out of of the corps in in 1991 
right. at the end of the first Gulf War. And I looked for an organization that could help me do what I'd been doing, which I subsequently found out had a name called coaching. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but um, uh, th n nobody had sort of called it that mm. uh, but beforehand. Uh, and then I started on a, on a, on a, a series of uh, undertakings, which took me through really um, d different aspects of leadership right. and, and really understanding leadership from a civilian point of view, as opposed to from uh a military point of view, although all the services, I think they would all say, are, are very different. Um, so I did a, a master's in essentially the psychology of change, and that really informed a, a model that I still use today, which is working individually, one-on-one -on -one with, it tends to be executives, mm. uh, working with teams and developing leadership skills uh, in teams, and then at an organizational level, helping uh, change cultures because cultures are really what drives an awful lot of the behavior that that happens in yeah. organizations and that really brings me up to today I, I i've i've specialized in some industries probably more than others in in particular banking pharmaceuticals and energy and that's taken me all over the world uh, particularly around facilitating offsites and t you know the key team meetings, which is a is a fantastic practice, and I I'm so glad that if for not any other reason the the pandemic is over and people are beginning to travel and and, and in spite of the power of Zoom and Teams and WebEx and all the rest of them, getting actually people in a room together you can't beat it. And, uh, uh, so, yeah. <clears throat> fully aligned with that your, your company is called serenity and leadership and uh, by the way i think it's a fantastic name when when you use the word serenity does it have any special meaning for you uh yes i think it does uh i i think that things are moving so fast these days mm. uh, and, and leaders are having to attend to so much more, so many more different pressures, and they're becoming much more stressed. And where can and, and are they good at prioritizing? Where do they spend their time? It's just so hard for leaders. Yeah. And what what they tend to forget is that that. There is this small voice inside. We all have it. And it's, if you can hear it, it guides you. It, it leads you. Uh, it helps you make really good decisions. Mm. And you need a bit of quiet to hear it. So for me, serenity, if, if your leadership is coming from a place of serenity, you are... Uh, the, the judgments you make, the the decisions, uh, and the way that you see the world is much more refined, and probably much more realistic. It, ha it has all sorts of benefits. I, mean, I can tell you stories of uh, rafting down the Grand Canyon and having these sort of these some of these inspirations, but fundamentally. We don't give ourselves the space to reflect. Mm. And if we do, it makes a big difference. Oh, yes. So let's try for that place of serenity. <laughs> no, I, I love it, to be honest, Tom. I mean, we're, we're kindred coaches and our, our careers overlap to some extent in different areas, not, not from the military side, but... Uh, from different aspects, facilitation, education. And some of the things that I read while I was doing my research around what you do, uh, I, I resonate with strongly. And, and that explanation uh, is, part of, is part of what I liked about it. You mentioned your background started, you know, after, after working a little bit in factories, you went into the military, into, into the Marines, 17 years. I, I'm wondering... Did the military experience shape your approach 
to leadership and organizational change. Now, I know you touched on that a little bit, but if you could expand on that would be, I think, helpful. So how much did that 17-year experience really guide you when it comes to leadership and organizational change? I think in the Marines, I met some extremely good leaders and I met one or two rubbish ones. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I think from the really, really good ones, uh, I learned a lot about leadership. I learned that really good leaders are not driven by ego at all. Right. They are, they tend to be very humble human beings who don't make a big fuss of being a leader. I think sometimes the louder a leader is, the less you should trust them. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think that's one thing. Uh, and, uh, another thing is the the amount of preparation that we used to put into doing things was enormous, mm. huge. And I remember uh, after the Falklands uh, conflict, a good friend of mine was the, the brigade major. Who, uh, essentially, it was his plan that got everybody from the ships to shore. It's a big job. It was a super responsible one. And he said to me, you know, uh, because we practice this so often, we had the basis of a plan. All we then did was adapt the plan to the current circumstances. Also knowing that the moment the balloon went up, the whole plan would go to rats. But nevertheless, having that baseline and everybody mm. knowing what their objective was, no objective rather than task, but yes. their objective, when everything went haywire, which of course it did, people still could carry on and lead within their, their sort of microcosm uh, of the whole macro situation. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I think that's something that uh, I've uh, encountered in, in organizations quite a bit, is that people don't do that. Right. They don't do that depth of planning. They don't do the, the depth of, of risk uh, management uh, mm. that they jolly well should be doing. And I, I think an, a real example of that today is cyber security yes. and how uh, organizations go to these experts and say, oh, my God, we've been hacked. And and the, the guy always says, well, yeah, if you'd come to me last week and talked about it, I could have helped you stop this. But for so many leaders, it's like, Ah, that's an expense. I, I've got other things to worry about. Mm. So um, the, the the whole sort of planning going into risk management, I think, is a is a particular aspect which I, I have a I have a view on because of of my time in the in the Marines. Okay, and back to the the name of the company, Serenity, to a large extent, right? So have, having that calmness, that peace of mind, and and that ability to, I guess, step back from the, the craziness to actually put those plans in place and to think things through. Yeah. So yeah, very nice. You, mm. you also, um, you mentioned that you've done your masters in some form of change. Um, you, you also have your NLP, your neuro linguistic programming, um, master practitioner certification. Uh, how, how much do your qualifications or the fields, those fields of study influence your day-to-day -day when you're working with clients? Do they play a large role? Probably. Mm. And, and the, the, the reason I say that is because I've done, I've done loads of training in loads of different ways. Mm. And so when I go into a client, it's like I'm carrying a large toolbox. Uh, and for a particular moment, I'll bring out a particular tool, right. but I don't plan that in uh, advance. Uh, having just talked about planning, it, it, from this point of view, it's the reverse. It's like yes. um, I, I need to let the organization wash over me 
because so often when an organization says, well, that's the problem, that's what we want you to fix. It's not the problem. Mm. It's just the presenting problem. So I'm more interested in saying, yeah, and where does that problem come from? Mm. So if we're going to, if we're going to put some resource and time and effort into this, let's deal with the real problem not the one that just is sort of sticking its its finger out, out, um, out of out of the the water or whatever. Mm. Um, so I think that's a that's a that's an important aspect, really. Right. So getting to the root cause rather than putting the band aid and treating the the symptom. Yeah. You know. Conscious leadership. Uh, I know this is one of your your pet subjects. Um, you emphasize the need for conscious leadership. What what does it actually mean when we talk about conscious leadership? What do you mean by that? Well, I think in the old days we we um, we used to train leaders with certain models in mind, and it was a very structured approach. Mm. And it doesn't work anymore. Mm. So, uh, as I've said, when I, we, I go into an organization, I want to stay, um, this very overused word, agile. Um, yes. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do a little bit of a dance to uh, just be aware of, of possible inputs from, from wh mm. wherever. Mm. And, and so, uh, for me, that's, it's less using my head and it's more using my heart. It's, it's more about feeling what's going on. Okay. And, uh, the, the, the point about being conscious a leader as a leader is that sense of awareness mm. of what's going on. It's like our, our, our bodies are extraordinary expressors and yet, most of us spend our life completely ignoring what the body is telling us. Mm. But you know, if I'm if I'm in in a particular situation, uh, what I and I I don't profess to be really good at this. It's it's something that I'm always trying to develop as a skill. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is to be sensitive to the, these these the soft voices the. The, the the soft sensations which actually are trying to inform me at a deep level of what's going on that's conscious leadership mm. it's at a, at a more simplistic level you could say well uh, you know i i come across you in in the, in the corridor or an office and my whole system from 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 millennia from before sort of cuts in so i have to assess you i judge you i make decisions about who you are and how you are and whether we're going to get on just based on at some level there's some good information that we're getting energetically but some of those decisions are going to be completely wrong and so uh, if i'm conscious then i'm going to challenge those things i'm going to say ah i notice he's got glasses i don't like people with glasses why mm. do i not because when i was 16 years old i got filled in by a guy who had glasses so i have this natural um um antipathy to mm. people with glasses I, you know obviously i'm making all this up but but uh, if i if i notice and say ah okay he's got glasses i notice that i have i'm now bringing an old belief into to, to this yes. it has no relevance in this moment so i have to override it but i have to do it consciously mm. and 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 the, and the thing is that we are driven by so many of these biases through our conditioning through our lives mm -hmm. and it really warps the way that we react in interrelate and of course yes. that's the basis of um uh inclusion and diversity which so many people are talking about mm. um it, most inclusion is being put down in most people 
because of unconscious biases and mm -hmm. and and processes going on that have no validity yeah. in the moment. So we have to challenge them. That's conscious leadership. Oh, I love that. We we could that's the that's the rest of the podcast. We could stay here for the <laughs> I mean this this area I, I really enjoy talking about as well. So I mean to get to that conscious stage we have to move out of most where we stay spend most of our time in the subconscious. We have to then be intentional. You know, there's a whole dynamic that goes on with being able to become conscious. Um I, I think you also talk about self-awareness a lot and I, I can see you're leaning into that topic there with with your answer. I, I always have one question around self-awareness and that is and this is just my own view, I'd be interested in yours. Um, I, I see self-awareness as our starting point, like step one, that we need to become more self-aware. Where I struggle and, and what I talk with my clients a lot about is the awareness is fantastic. It, it's, it's a given. We must become more self-aware. But then learning to do something with the awareness is where I find a lot of people fall over. So we become extremely self-aware, and I could use myself <laughs> as a case study, and then for whatever reason, we don't take the actions to modify or to, to change. So we don't regulate. What, what's your thoughts around that? I'm just curious. Hmm. Well, uh, we run a, um, a, a an online leadership program, and and the first module uh, is sort of titled "Know Thyself," mm. and the second module is "Lead Thyself." Mm. And I suppose, in, in a sense, what you're talking about now is is the lead bit. Yes. So I have all this information. So what am I going to do with it? Yeah. How am I going to apply that? Uh, and you know, I think I think the two go sort of very much hand in hand. Mm. But sometimes we, I, I guess that one aspect of this is self discipline. So I get all these prompts, I get all these thoughts, I, I get all this information. What am I going to do with it? Yeah. And do I want to, to do anything with it? You know, you look at social media today with Instagram and Facebook and all these things, and people spend hours just flipping, mm -hmm. you know, from one, one image to the next. You see it particularly in kids, but also in adults. And I, I think partly perhaps what defines an adult is the the ability to say i stop now hmm. um, because this is not actually my priority right yeah yeah no it's 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 a very fascinating topic we could talk for a long time on it you, you also um talk a lot about psychological safety uh i I've recently done a trip uh, through Europe and Americas delivering a, a leadership program. And I developed the program myself. So included in that program was a topic on psychological safety. I was extremely surprised how many people had no idea what that term was or meant. <laughs> Is that your experience at all? Or are you you um, finding people more understanding? I think it for you and I, Wayne, it's quite easy to get sort of sucked into uh, the communities that we dwell in, where mm. conversations can be quite sophisticated. But if I look at an organization, somebody who's you know running a department or in the C-suite, they have their um, things that they're doing. And 
for for a lot of leaders the whole concept of what they call with great disdain you know soft skills yes uh is it's just a pain it's it's just something we have to spend money on and i don't want to do that mm. whereas whereas actually some of these things are, are are supremely important but unless they've been in that environment it's perhaps not reasonable to expect that they have heard of some of these terms mm. um so I, I you know i think it's it it's quite possible to judge some of these people and and, and actually it's not fair it, they've oh, just got sure. their own fo focus points yeah. I, I remember working with um some uh patent attorneys in new york a few years ago and what an extraordinary group of people they were you know patent attorneys have a, a doctorate a phd in two totally different uh, areas. One is law, and the other one is a kind of science. Mm -hmm. So th these, these are people who, I mean, the whole life is full with the expertise they've got. So if you started talking to them about psychological si safety, they, I'm quite sure, would look at you and say, well, what planet do you come from? I, <laughs> it's, it's just not in my, my, my thought process. Yeah, no, that's that's fair comment. That's fair comment. I, I'm probably am skewed. I have a good friend uh, who's a co-author of uh, a book called Psychological Safety Playbook, um, and it, I find it a great book. And I, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but um, if not, then I'll, I'll send you the link. Mm. When, when you're working with um, clients, I mean, do you introduce the concept, and and if so? like on a very simplistic level, are there any immediate practical steps that our listeners who are predominantly leaders could take away and, and put into place from a psychological safety perspective? I'm sure. I think, I think the first question is, do I, do I, do I think that I'm getting unbiased and um honest input from my team each person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i wouldn't just make the judgment myself i i'd ask around right. <laughs> because if you're not getting the full a spectrum if you like of communication from each person in your team there isn't psychological safety mm -hmm. yeah. and without psychological safety you have low levels of trust right. and trust is the fundamental sort of baseline for the the, the good functioning of a team mm -hmm. So I I check that out, and uh, because I would be bringing my own biases on this, I, I would get input from other people. Yeah. Uh, not not least the 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 team itself. You, know, you could say, well, do people feel safe to express themselves here? Mm. Now, of course, they may say, yeah, yeah, we feel fine, but they don't. Because you're not actually, it, it takes a brave person to say, well, actually, no, I don't think you are getting the best from us. Exactly. But that's where you want to get to, because when you, you begin to have that honest communication, then you're getting somewhere. Mm. Uh, you, you need the, the honesty that leads to something real, something authentic. Yeah. It's one of the things that, that we talk about a lot in our programs is don't expect that you introduce this one day and it's done. It's there. This is something that takes time. You're going to have to continually work at and with this concept to really bring it to life to your point. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yes. What, what about the but, topics around? Oh, sorry, Tom, go on. No, sorry. Well, I, I was just going to say psychological safety is incredibly important mm. and uh, if if a team feels that they can be themselves and they feel safe in that way when they're together, 
yeah. that team will will outperform the others. It will. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen that myself. I've witnessed it. I couldn't agree more. I. What about a couple of topics that sort of run in parallel to psychological safety, and they they are topical, as you mentioned a couple already, diversity and inclusion. Um, the the broader topic, I guess, is social responsibility, and then tagged on to diversity and inclusion, we now have equity or equality and and belonging. Where do they fit for you within this this whole? psychological space if you like and and trying to bring them to bear in an organization yeah i think inclusion is 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 super important and when i'm helping an organization change its culture mm. uh, i will talk about inclusion because if people feel included then the likelihood that you're going to have a diverse group is great greater mm. And where you have diversity, you're going to have more creativity. You're going to have more creative conflict, which you really need. Yep. Uh, because you're getting different input from different people, from different backgrounds. So yep. that's 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 really, really important, I think. And it's, without that lot, equity, you know, you can forget, really. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so that's um, that that sort of on that side, and the, the the corporate social responsibility. I think that's. I I I think it's just down to those dynamics. If you have a leader that's encouraging that level of trust and 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 safety, then the, the conversations that might. St come out and say hey boss uh let's spend an afternoon next month and go to the local school mm. and uh g give our services do doing whatever it is um you know digging a digging a trench or um, painting a wall i i don't know whatever it, i i think that um, organizations today really need to be challenging themselves it, particularly in terms of what is their footprint mm. on this earth in other words are they here just to make money or is there something deeper and more meaningful that the organization is is involved in doing and, and if that's the case what is that you know, I think young people coming into organizations today are much more concerned and interested in the purpose of the organization. And interviews tend, not all around the world, clearly, but in a lot of places, to be much more two-way. So it's not just about, oh, well, we've got 10 people to interview and we're going to make the the, the choice uh, there's also well those ten people are much more likely today to say well I, I, are you the the employer that I want to work with mm. rather than work for and so there's this mindset and I think a lot of leaders particularly older ones are finding that whole that whole concept of challenge really quite difficult to deal with mm. but it's actually very healthy oh yes. Uh, organizations need to be thinking about their their footprint they need to be thinking about uh, what effect they're doing their business is having and also if they're producing products or whatever what effect the products are having mm. you know you look at microplastics now they're, they're finding microplastics in pretty much every human being on the planet mm. well that's and, and nobody knows what the the effect of that is going to be yet yeah. but you could say that plastics firms really need to be exploring that and doing their thing rather than burying their heads in the sand and looking at well how do we mitigate this how do we reduce this um because we have a, a social responsibility 
not just a responsibility to shareholders to make money. Mm. It, it's a huge topic, of course, right? And uh, the whole ESG movement uh, with with the social responsibilities in the middle there. Unfortunately, my own experience is I, I see it still, for the, for the most part, lip service and people satisfying the legislative need rather than actually taking that responsibility you're talking about. And, um, <clears throat> you know, stepping up to the plate, so to speak, and say, this is, this is who we want to be as a company, not, not just the largest profit maker that we can be type of thing. So I, I have to ask you the next question, Tom, which is, which is about this, um, this, Thing I uncovered when I was doing some what well, I should say first of all one of the things I enjoy about being a podcast host is the research and the reason is I, I get to learn so much as I'm looking at each guest invariably I come across something that I didn't know about and in, in your case happily I experienced several of those moments so thank you for that so <laughs> The, the first one, of course, that I've already mentioned and, and failed miserably at pronouncing was, and you'll have to guide me again, equine. 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 Equine, equine, equine guided. guided. Experiential learning. So please <laughs> enlighten the listeners as well as myself. What What is this all about? Well, uh, of course, it, it comes from the Latin equus for, for a horse. Mm. And... Uh, I came across this work oof, quite a long time ago when I was uh, studying organization, family and organizational constellations. Mm. Uh, and I, I found that uh, there was this guy in, in Holland that was using a horse rather than human beings as representatives. And so I went out and found out what, at all about it. And then when I was in the States shortly afterwards, there was a client of mine who said, hey, look, we're, we want you to facilitate our offsite, but we want to do something different. Mm. Uh, and so I said, I have the very thing. And so I uh, I did some research and and found, of course, in America, you know, the horses are ubiquitous. So uh, I found this, this, uh, this, this pair, um, one a, um, a therapist, and the other, a, uh, a a kind of horse whisperer, really. Right. Uh, and so I said, well, look, can you work with this this team? And they said, yeah, sure. So uh, we r ran f this this afternoon exercise, which was really b drawing out how the team was communicating internally. The thing about horses is that uh, you can't lie to them. Okay. Horses are incredibly sen sensitive beings. And uh, if they detect the inauthenticity of a liar uh, or someone who's holding back from communicating something that, that clearly is needed, the horse... Um, feels that dissonance. So if you ask it very nicely to just go walk, even just round and round in, in a in a round pen, it won't do it. it. Won't do it. It's just something just as simple as getting it to walk round. It won't. So uh, it's a, the horse in that sense is a kind of barometer for the quality of the team. Mm. Uh, and that can be extended in all sorts of ways. You know, when you you try and get a, a team to get a horse to do something very simple, like just trot over a a little a little um bar. What unless they're working as a team, it won't happen. So actually and and by the way, it's jolly difficult to do. Uh, but if the horse is, is co cooperating, uh, the the chances are that, that team actually is a very good team. So uh, it teaches you it teaches you um, 
about some of the unseen or the unspoken aspects of the dynamics of an individual group. Mm. Uh, and you can also try it out, I suppose, for those that understand the, the science of dowsing, it's a little bit like the same. You can ask uh, a pendulum a question. Um, I think for some of the people who your listeners, they'll, they'll have encountered this when people, you get water diviners who on the whole are extraordinarily accurate <laughs> and nobody wants to understand really how it all works, but it does. And um, if you try out with a horse, uh, say a new plan as the CEO of a program, and we did this, I remember doing this in, in Denver, uh, we um, uh, the, the CEO had a new plan, very proud of it she was too. And she explained it to the horse. And the horse was completely uninterested, <laughs> totally uninterested. And then she turned around to us and said, it looks like I've got to go back to the drawing board and think this through. And the horse completely perked up. <laughs> it's really, it's amazing. <laughs> So um, they are barometers. They are amazing beings. They have a a huge heart and heartbeat that it just helps them be uh, really, really sensitive. Mm. Um, so yeah, beautiful, amazing animals. That, that's really fascinating. Some in some regards ties into another area that I, I observed when looking at what you do, and, and that is systemic constellations. Now, mm. I, I'm a coach. I also use this method. But what, what I found interesting is not many other people that I know, at least, um, adopt systemic constellations as part of their coaching toolkit. And um, I, I think it's an extremely powerful uh, technique as well and really eye-opening for the individual that, that is involved in, in the exploration. Um, how are you using that? Just briefly, like how do you apply that within your own coaching world or with your clients? Well, you, you'll know that one of the, the challenges of, of constellations is the, the logistics of, of the people that you need in order to work, make it work. And getting people from within an organization to produce the people doesn't really work very well. Can, but you know, it's not, it's not very good. So, uh, uh, what I tend to do is to get groups to constellate things. Like for instance, I remember having an offsite in Paris and, and, um, the, the head of EMEA, uh, was trying to understand the dynamics of what was going on across all the different countries that he was responsible for. Mm. And I just got people to stand relative to each other and how they were communicating, which is a kind of constellation. It's not the conventional sort, sure. but just using that, it, it highlighted a number of things very quickly. Uh, where one department was feeling left out mm. uh, and, and, and th there were a group of people that actually the work they were doing was p being particularly despised by uh, an, another group. And that, mm. that actually wouldn't have come out otherwise. But it was a, it was a really good uh, indicator yeah. for work to be done. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a hybrid, but that's certainly one example of, of how I've done it. Yeah, you know, as you, as you explained there, I think it can be so powerful. So um, I my, I have a, a hybrid version of it myself. So I have a board um, and we have the, the wooden figures and the, the client moves the figure relative to the other, the rest of the team, so to speak. But when, when you can have the real people in the group, um, it, it's much more dynamic. You know, it's... it's yeah. Uh, I guess akin to doing in-person training and uh, virtual training uh, in a to way. a large extent. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I've got a million questions and I know we're always pressed for time. Um, 
I'd love to get into cross-cultural challenges and uh, just understand a little bit about your thoughts. One of the things that I see in the world today is that we have such a globalised workforce, particularly for the larger organisations, and there seems to be a huge gap with the cross-cultural intelligence of a lot of leaders. Um, now, I know you've worked with organisations in, in many parts of the world, so I was curious how you see that. Um, I have my own thoughts, but I'd love to hear how you see that situation. <clears throat> You know, there's the the old story of um, uh, if you give a, a a a person a hammer, everything will look like a nail. <clears throat> yep. And I I think that uh, for for leaders who haven't been internationally socialized, they do have this challenge quite often of judging everybody by the limited experience they've got of of human beings and the fact is that and you must know this better than than most i guess because of your time in in the far east in china and uh so on uh people are very different and their cultures are very different yes and I think that what is incredibly important is to honor that mm. so that you're taking, you're bringing a, a level of curiosity rather than judgment to any interaction with someone uh, from a different culture. Mm. And as I've as I've already said, you know, when I talked about meeting you in the in the corridor and not liking you because you you wear glasses, we do have all these uh, beliefs and and uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and limiting ideas, um, which actually cripple our ability to get the best out of people from from all different backgrounds mm. um and and you know we go back to self-awareness the whole the whole sort of idea about um uh really understanding what the conditioning that we bring it's like um you can you can only see somebody through the lenses of your conditioning and experience, and that act can be incredibly limiting. And so, f finding finding ways to drop that and to, as I said, be curious, learn about other people, learn about other different cultures, and then not to apply that learning indiscriminately because mm. uh you know you in in the west you think about the, the japanese and japanese are always bowing and they're all doing th this that and and uh, the way they uh, deal with a problem you know some of that might be true mm. but it's not always true and so again it just op being open opening ourselves to difference that's that's the thing because we are naturally hardwired to be scared of difference. Yes. Because we we come from a tribal background, and so and and that's what you know. You you hear people talking in organisations, tribes. Uh, it's it's great in one way, and it's very damaging in another. Mm. So. Um, as the French would say, vive la différence. <laughs> Which means? Long live the difference. It, Long live the difference. Uh, let's, 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 uh, let's honor that. <clears throat> um, and, and be excited because somebody is different. 
rather than saying, oh dear, that person's different, therefore I can't or won't engage with them. Mm. Oh, I think we have a long way to go in that regard. So, <laughs> but it, it does lead me into the next area that I that I know you're also um, involved in, which is conflict mediation, and mm. you know this this misunderstanding or the biases we carry with us often lead us down that path of then co having conflict with these people, and. Um, you spoke about risk uh, becoming more risk adverse and understanding. And I'm wondering about, <clears throat> you know, is there any key pointers that you would talk with your clients about that our listeners could benefit by when it comes to a situation when you're in conflict? How, how do we or how can we go about minimising the damage that we're we're potentially going to create is there anything that you normally advise people to do as a starting point well, the first thing is to breathe mm. <laughs> um, I think when people are in conflict and if you monitor their breathing it's it's very tight and it's uh, it's very high in the chest so all the oxygen that needs to get down to the parts of us where some common sense might reside that isn't happening so yeah. actually just taking a moment to breathe is is a very good start again it's it's um being self-aware enough in that moment <laughs> and being able to do that is is the challenge for many all right mm. the, the blood has a tendency to uh, to boil very quickly the emotions yeah. drive drive a lot of reactions, yeah, or a lot of actions. And 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 we live in a world where there are so many examples, dreadful examples of how to relate. Uh, you only need to look at Gaza and and what's going on there. You don't need to look any further than that, in a sense. So, I, um, I, I think. The, the next thing, I, again, I've said it before, is encouraging curiosity. Mm. You know, if you can get people to be curious about the other side, what's making them say this? What's making them dig their heels in? Mm. Uh, and, you know, if you can do it to get people to just cross the room and be the other party, yep. that, can be, that can be enormously powerful. Yes. Because what we tend to do when we're angry at, and defensive is we close down the 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 um the ability to be empathetic to the other side mm. so i think those are good start points uh, you, you know everybody's right in a way yeah. And and um, they won't see it that way. They'll think they're right and everybody else is wrong. But it's so much easier when you've got to a, a, a stage where, like, for instance, uh, when if you and I are fighting, right, and the, the facilitator says, right, Tom, listen to Wayne. So, Wayne, you explain your, your situation and where you're coming from. Right, Tom, now you give that back to him. You relate to him what he has just said. Mm. And it gives people that time, that pause, where they they have to think not from their own point of view, but from the others. Yep. And very often that's enough to break the dam. Mm. So, yeah, there's a lot of little things like that. We, we often introduce the Thomas Kilman model to help people understand what their own style is. And then we have another tool that we use for managing conflict, which is the IBR approach, that interest-based relational approach. I'm not sure if you've seen that one, but that, that's very similar step one to what you just mentioned there. So, so very good. There's a couple of things you mentioned the first time we connected 
And I just want to go back to those because they, they really stuck with me. They resonated for some reason. The first was you said, voicing things often brings clarity. And mm -hmm. as, a, as a facilitator, as an educator, of course, couldn't agree more, right? But I, I'm just wondering, is there an example that comes to mind where you've actually seen yourself voicing something and as a result of talking about it, you've become clearer yourself? Is there any, I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, but is there anything that you could share with us that could sort of illustrate the point behind that statement? Hmm. Um, you know, I'm I'm trying to get there. Um, <laughs> you know, for, from a for, you know from a coaching point of view, I think one of the the great powers of a coach is just to ask the right questions. Mm. If you ask great questions, then the individual, by speaking about this issue, can often get much much clearer. Yeah. Uh, and and the coach isn't doing anything more than asking great questions mm. uh so i think you know from 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 my point of view uh you know i've got a coach and i talk things uh through and uh I'm 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 struggling to find a a, a good example. Just to, no, it's okay. Um, well, I I didn't mean to put you on the spot with the question, but no, I I like I like the comment very much because I I also resonate with that, and you know even reflecting um, somehow then when I can talk about what I've reflected on helps helps me to get to that point. So uh, I can imagine the other thing that you did mention. Um, and I, I had to go away and think about it in more detail. So you really got me thinking about it. But we, we were talking about the current world dynamic and how it's being spurred on by different events like climate change, war, pandemics. And you said it's creating people movement as well as polarization um, when we really need unity. Mm. Uh, Absolutely. Um, I I thought about that for a few days and I thought, gosh, that's that's so insightful. What what's the background to what you're meaning by that statement? Well uh the 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 problems that the world is facing are the big ones are are, are global. Mm. You, you know, you. I was. I was thinking about uh, birds and animals movements. You know, if you if you look at uh, birds that that fly halfway cr across the world, that they, they're not interested in in um, boundaries between countries, mm. uh, and the same with. It's like when you 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 build a motorway, and now some enlightened countries create uh, uh, bridges which are specifically for animals to cross. So in, instead of getting decimated on the road, they can they can go because for them this line of a road is an arbitrary yes. obstacle, uh, and they're finding that actually with this 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 wall that they've built down between Mexico and America. Mm. There's all these animals that would normally be crossing and they can't. Yep. So uh, we, we have all these arbitrary lines drawn on, on the ground and it's enabled people to s sort of keep their individuality. And at the same time, it's been an excuse for uh, millions of people to be killed. And the, the 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 problem now, if you just take climate change for instance, uh, that that's that's not being more or less in one country or another. 
Mm. It's affecting the whole globe in different ways. And what we need, therefore, are people from, regardless of where they come from, their country, but to come together and say, how can we as a global population deal with this? And in order to do that, you've then got to start looking at the finances of all these things because everything is 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 generated is is motivated by by money uh and you know you can go to your grave covered in gold or dollar bills or whatever but it's not going to change anything uh so uh, if we really want to create a, a world which is inhabitable for our children and their children then we have to get together we have to hold hands to to deal with this and the time in order to do that is getting very 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 short indeed now because things in the world like climate change over a period of time right. uh, and when you you set a, a dynamic in in train it isn't going to be stopped just uh by one particular act or other mm. um and you know another aspect aspect of this is as it, it, things get more developed and let's be clear people say save the planet the planet's fine mm. it's whether the planet is, is supporting a uh, an environment which is suited to us as human beings because we are actually very intolerant. The, the 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 level of temperature and so on that we can live in is really quite small. Mm. Uh, and so uh, where where the, the climate change is really having an effect, you're going to get uh, f just let's let's take rising waters. You know, I can't remember what the percentage of 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 major cities around the world are that are very susceptible to flooding. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, I mean, all, all that's going to do is to start making enormous numbers of the world move. And you've got all these these countries at the moment who's saying, we, we can't deal with immigration, we can't have more people coming in here. And then they do hideous things to people who are trying to escape their nightmare to get to a place which is safer. Mm -hmm. And they ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> the the levels of of um, human movement that are going to take place in, in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we've never seen anything like it. Uh, mm -hmm. And and so unless we act as grown ups, that's going to lead to a lot of war and a lot of killing. Mm -hmm. So um, let's let's start practicing being grown ups. I don't like finishing on dire notes, but uh, I, I think that's a that's a very sound warning for everybody listening. What advice would you give to an aspiring leader? Let's say they're just beginning their journey. Maybe focus on conscious leadership and um, how to deal with change within their organisation. Any any pieces of advice you would offer them? Well, I. I think that the greatest gift that one human being can give to another is their full presence. Mm. So if you're a young leader and you're responsible for some people, just practice that one. You know, uh, it's so obvious when you're on the phone and you're doing something as well as talking to it's obvious mm. you know if you're doing an email or you're deleting one or it it's obvious so stop it yeah. <laughs> put down your phone close off the screen of of the pc or whatever and just be with that person because the amount of time that you need will be much less and you will hear them and they will yeah. feel that they are heard and when people feel like they are heard, 
they will do all sorts of amazingly positive things. Very, very sound advice. Thank you, Tom. Where where can people connect with you if they would like to learn more about what you're doing or they'd like to follow you? Well, thank you, Wayne. Um, we have the website, which is serenityinleadership.com. Mm -hmm. Please visit it. There's stacks of blogs and links to videos, and there's all sorts of resources there. Mm -hmm. um, we have this uh, leadership program going, and that's part of the... Uh, it's an on online program. Um, it's not totally suited to people in where you are, in that... Uh, we we tend to run it sort of the early evening in the UK, which uh, makes it a little bit late for, little for bit the late, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know we've got people from the US through to uh, um, Africa on the program yeah. now, which yeah. is which is exciting because the, the people are so different and they bring such different uh, ideas, and that's what that's what I love. So we can learn from each other. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. It's uh, if you search for serenity and leadership, or you look for leading responsibly with integrity and purpose. That's the uh, the title of the the series on on there. We're on Instagram. We're on um, Twitter uh, or X, and um, and a, a bit on Facebook. But I guess the biggest is LinkedIn. Look me up. Um, link up with me. Uh, give me your comments. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you didn't like in what I've I've been saying. I'd love to uh, to learn. So that would be amazing. Thank you, Wayne. Yeah, look, great uh, discussion, Tom, and uh, wonderful to to catch up. I know I delayed the uh, the session for a number of weeks, but uh, great to have the opportunity. And thank you for sharing. You know, so many insights. I'm sure the listeners got a lot out of it. So we'll put the links as we always do in the show notes. And, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, our listeners will connect with you and uh, there will, may be some interest. Maybe we'll have to talk about bringing the program to Asia. <laughs> well, I'd love to do that. I Because uh, I did work with an old drilling company and, um, you know, the, as they moved around, it, some people splintered off. So I've got some contacts in Singapore. Mm. Uh, and... Um, I'm uh, over in Australia a fair amount because um, my my son lives in Perth, so uh, I'd uh, I'd love to come over yeah. more to that part of the world. That would be great. There you go. All right, Tom. Well, thank you very much for being a wonderful guest on the ET Project, and uh, we'll we'll keep in contact and uh, catch up next time. Brilliant, Wayne. Good luck yourself. Thank you. So, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon so I can pop up in your feed occasionally with a great tip for your ultimate growth.